Hey, imagine this. You're driving in your car and suddenly on the dash, red light comes on. It's, it's a warning light. You're being told something's gone wrong. So what do you do? Do you pull over and uh, try to find out what the heck's going on? Uh, do you look under the bonnet? Um, do you phone for roadside assistance? Or do you just get a band-aid and stick it over the warning light so that you can't see the red light anymore? The answer to those questions may seem pretty obvious, in, but like I have to tell you, in today's show about bunions, you're going to find out that the answer isn't as simple or as obvious as you might think. G'day, I'm Red Ted Jed. Coming to you live from our beautiful home office of Ted Education here in South Australia. I gotta tell you, it's pretty much my dream location. In today's Triple T show, uh, we're gonna continue with part two of a four part series about treating bunions. Yes, you heard that right, four part series. See, last week we were gonna do a three part series on bunions. This week, Thanks to some awesome questions and requests, uh, we're delivering a gangbuster four-part series all about bunions. So hold on to your chin hairs, because this is going to be another belly-popping Triple T series. Oh, there goes another one. All right. So um, we had a uh, phenomenal response to last week's Triple T show, where we chatted about diagnosing bunions, making sure that we got the diagnosis, like getting it right. If you haven't caught up with that show yet, you can still find it on uh, this page, Foot Mobilization Techniques, on Facebook. Um, special shout outs to uh, Dean in the Wild West, um, also Mighty Manu in Canada. Great to hear from you as always. And Dean, thank you. I saw the document uh, uh, flick through. So, um, uh, this will, for everyone else, this will make more sense uh, in a little while. Um, I mentioned in our last uh, Triple T show about how often I get asked about bunions. And given my you know, 30 plus years uh, career as a uh, health practitioner, I've certainly treated a lot of bunions. Uh, I've also trained a, probably thousands of health practitioners so that they can get even better clinical outcomes for first MP joint pathologies through manual therapies. And that's not all, because there is someone very special who's keen to, oh jeez, take over the show. Right here, okay, let's have a, a little bit of a look-see, okay, and uh, uh, a lot of you ask, uh, do ask about uh, Penny Lee and uh, whether she's going to feature in today's show, and <laughs> right on cue. She's been sleeping all morning, but uh, now it's, uh, okay, here we go, ready? Uh, no, she's not interested in playing. Okay, there goes the flying cat. <laughs> All right, so, um, I can say, I'm probably a little more excited than usual today to bring you today's Triple T show. And given I'm a bit, um, well, I am based down under, uh, today's Ted's tips uh, are going to be a little bit upside down, maybe even a little controversial. Say what you think. Ted's tips upside down. Does that mean that could help me with my... Developing man boobs, uh, okay, and, whoops, sorry, I, I divert. Look, when it comes to treating first MP joint uh, pathologies, you know, and treating them conservatively, some of my surgical colleagues, well, they've been pretty quick to slam the treatment options that I use. But, you know, with all due respect, perhaps they have a vested interest in doing so. Or maybe they would just like to have a little bit of a drink. What do you think? Have a drink here? Yes, good. Uh, testing, one, two. Testing, testing. But seriously, if you think the only way to treat first MP joint uh, pathologies is through surgery, uh, and surgery is the only answer, then don't waste your time watching this show. You can turn off now and go organise your sock drawer. Uh, this show won't be for you. But if you think conservative treatments for first MP joint pathologies do have merit, then stay tuned uh, because uh, there's probably a little bit more of a tale to be told uh, in uh, today's show. If you're willing to at least open up uh, the possibilities, well, there's a few possibilities there, <laughs> then stay tuned. Oh, and there goes the doorbell. You know what that means? Uh, one of Leo's online shopping uh, deliveries has <laughs> just come right through, and that's our uh, alarm uh, bell going off right there with our dog. So, home office, 
It's the place to be. You're never alone, let me tell you. While my manual therapy uh, colleagues all around the world, as long as they keep seeing bunions get better in their very own clinics through conservative treatments and achieving those results without risky side effects, then I'm going to keep on talking about it. And today, you're going to get the full lowdown on a very specific bunion assessment technique that you can literally try in your own clinic in about 20 minutes time. You'll be able to then decide for yourself the value of outside the box thinking. So as I said, let's take some little ideas and spin it across uh, the desk here. And if you've got an open mind and uh, that you know, your brain content hasn't uh, flicked out with that fan, then please stay tuned. Now, Let's just get us uh, on track and focused and into a biomechanical mode. So I've got you got a um, an, an anatomy question for you. What has a bottom at the top? If you know the answer, well, speaking of bottoms, uh, what has a bottom at the top? Type in your answer down below and let's see if uh, anyone's uh, on track here. Okay, so the question is, what has a bottom at the top? Answer, your legs. A bottom at the top. <sighs> Dad joke, Ted joke, sounds similar, don't they? Okay, uh, depending on what you think on that, uh, either a thumbs up across the screen or maybe a sad face dribbling across the screen. Um, I'll take it all as feedback. Uh, there is no failure, only feedback. Oh, geez, here comes another new age cliche. Okay, so look, in today's Triple T bunion busting t show, Today's topic, which is, uh, thank you, uh, part two of a series of four, we're going to jump into... <laughs> she wants to see where the uh, drum kit's kept. Uh, we normally put the sticks away. Today's topic is when treating bunions, don't touch the first MP joint. What? Did I say, don't touch the first MP joint when it comes to treating bunions? No, 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 no. Can't touch this. No, 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 no. Treating bunions. Don't touch this. No, okay. So, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I got a little bit spontaneously carried away with myself. Anyway, look, before you start wondering whether I really did fall on my head as a baby, um, let's do a quick uh, recap of last week's show. So, making sure we're all on the same page. Last week, we discussed the three different systemic conditions that affect the first MTP joint. Oh, excuse me, Pen. You just shift over there. I know you got yourself all slotted <laughs> out. Okay, bring one beast. So this was uh, the freebie. And what you can see uh, on uh, my sheet here is we've got the differential diagnosis. Uh, Penny's having a little bit of a uh, look around here uh, that uh, affect uh, the first MP joint. We've also got the neuropathic condition. Plus, there is also 10 mechanically based first MP joint. <laughs> okay, to take over the show. No, no, go and <laughs> uh, Good, you're still there. Uh, if you are still there, maybe you're just a, a thumbs up to let me know you're on board here. Oh, okay. Look. Okay, flying cat number two. I'm running out of props here, though. Okay, so have a close look here. Uh, the differential diagnosis for mechanical conditions. These are the conditions that we most typically see in our clinics. Now, I've highlighted seven of the ten. I feel like I'm doing a bit of product pl uh, placement here, uh, or maybe I'm uh, selling some shampoo items. But you'll see seven of the ten conditions are highlighted. I'll let you have a close look here. Now, tell me, can you pick why these seven and not the other three have been highlighted? What do they all have in common? Any guesses? Type in your answer. So we've got uh, the bunions, osteophytes, hallux valgus, uh, degenerative joint disease, hallux limitus, uh, also the uh, capsules, uh, capsule ligament impingements. All right, sorry, I'm trying to read this from behind. Uh, and in reverse, synovial impingements. All right, so what do they all have in common? The answer is those conditions 
that I've just listed out or highlighted there, they develop due to a shift or displacement of the hallux. Now, look, actually, so do uh, the other conditions, but the ones that I've highlighted here, these are the conditions that you'll be able to directly help in your clinics right now, particularly after today's show. Now, the reason why I said earlier, uh, in the, earlier in the show, I said that to help these conditions specifically, that you must, no, 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 don't touch the first MP joint. I've got to give you some context to explain why I'm uh, making that claim. After all, I mean, treating first MP joint uh, problems by not touching the first MP joint sounds a little bit uh, counterintuitive, doesn't it? Now, to give you the necessary context, uh, I need to cover some key biomechanical and physiological elements. To do this, I'm going to refer to a premise that's not really well understood within podiatry, but it's certainly well acknowledged and appreciated in uh, physiotherapy, chiropractic, osteopathy, and uh, the other manual therapy uh, professions. And that is, our bodies, like literally every tissue, every organ, every connective tissue structure, muscles, ligaments, tendons, they're wrapped in a lining known as fascia. The musculoskeletal structures that you're dealing with in your clinic, they're all enveloped in this web that fully connects with itself and to every other part of the body. A great text that I've referred to in the past, um, Thomas Meyer's uh, Anatomy Trains. Uh, I think uh, here, is it on this page, pen uh, that uh, we had something that, no, oh, no, 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 we can't touch this. All right, so just to give you an idea of um, some of the, uh, the research and with the um, modern microscopy and electron uh, gizmos that they can use, they can examine, assess and dissection methods. Uh, what you'll see here is uh, tr some tremendous uh, graphics uh, and also well, this chapter is uh, fully on uh, fascia and biomechanical regulation. So it plays a key role in literally our body organising itself from a biomechanical perspective. Um, in uh, general terms, I think of uh, uh, in, down here in Australia, it's the, currently the season of oranges and citrus fruit. So if you go into uh, the local market or um, uh, supermarket and looking to get yourself some um, a bag of oranges, you know how the, the bag comes in those uh, plasticky, uh, almost like fishnet uh, type structures? Think of that being like uh, the network of fascia around a, a specific anatomical structure. If you've got that bag and then you pull on one part of it, it's like that whole netting will need to respond in some way. In fact, you can't move one part. We're going to have electrocution there uh, if you keep uh, chewing on that cord. Yes. Hey. So we've got the bag of oranges, and if we pull on one part, it will affect every fibre of the rest of it. In fact, you cannot not affect the whole structure, even when you just pull on one part. It, it will be affected to some degree. Now, I mean, you've heard the term uh, kinetic chain. So we're all familiar with that. Well, the Maya fascia plays a crucial role in transmitting forces and feedback up and down that kinetic chain. Now, when it comes to treating most first MP joint uh, pathologies, here comes the key premise that's crucial to understand, and that is the site of the first MP joint, like the site of pain in the first MP joint, is actually the point of failure in the kinetic chain. It's the effect rather than the cause. You see, the cause is usually due to resistance elsewhere or dysfunction elsewhere in the kinetic chain. Look, if you only take one thing away from today's show, it's this premise, and I'll summarise it for you right now. The site of pain is the point of failure in the kinetic chain. It's actually rarely the cause of the problem. Rather, it is the effect. You see, the cause is usually due to resistance or dysfunction somewhere else in that chain. I mean, practical examples that uh, you'll be able to relate to. Um, 
Think of the last patient that came in to see you in your clinic and described their sciatic pain. You know, you know it's pain that injury in uh, the uh, sciatic, to the sciatic nerve from a um, cause that's happening up in the pelvis or in the spine uh, lumbar region, and it causes that uh, referred pain down the leg. In fact, uh, just on Saturday, uh, I was visiting our, our local central market and uh, my fishmonger, Costa, baby! Um, Costa, he was, uh, he's a client of ours as well, and uh, his problem has actually been uh, plantar heel pain. Interestingly, he was uh, recently he's been uh, hospitalised and off work uh, because of uh, the uh, of uh, back pain, but he noticed that now his foot pain was actually uh, playing up again as well, and uh, so we were discussing there's a direct correlation to what he's experiencing in his foot structure directly related to what's happening in his back. And another example might be when you hit your funny bone. It's not so funny, is it? But you'll get that zinging that uh, rips down your hand um, as a result of hitting here. You might feel it in the hand, but the problem or the cause of the problem actually came uh, at the nerve in your elbow. Now, look, I know these are neurological examples, but my fascia works in the same way. Like it's the way it's connected from proximal to distal, and then there's communications and impacts and compensations that happen along that chain. What I'm going to reveal to you today is where specifically you need to examine the myofascial chain first when you're treating first MP joint problems. Now, this way, by identifying those areas first, you'll actually go a long way to identifying the real cause of your client's problem. In fact, here's a, another, this, this one, when I learned this point, it, it absolutely belly button went from an innie to an outie straight away. And what that was, was you should only treat the myofascial sites of dysfunction only at the beginning of your treatment. So especially if it's, you've got a client who's complaining of first MP joint pain, this area is tender and irritated. So on the first treatment, maybe even the first second, uh, or first two, even three treatments, you would be treating the, the myofascial dysfunctions away from that site. Because if you've got an acutely um, stirred up, inflamed uh, area, and it's quite sensitive, and you start working on it, however you're going to do that, either physically, manually, the chances are you're going to stir it up, aren't you? Does this make sense? If what I'm saying so far is making sense to you, please type in a yes and uh, let me know that uh, everyone says, or if, you, if it's not making sense or you have a question, absolutely type it in. I'm here to uh, engage and um, discuss with you and share whatever uh, wisdom or benefits I can for you. Okay, so... In the past, my approach to treating foot problems, wherever it was, was typically, oh, if it hurts here, well, then I would start working out how am I going to treat in that area. But you need to appreciate that the painful site is just an indicator. There's probably a problem elsewhere in the kinetic chain or the myofascial chain. The pain site is just the point of failure. It's like the weak link in the chain. And this is where we swing back to the analogy I used at the beginning of the show. Remember how we were driving along in the car and uh, on the dash, a red light, a warning light uh, started flashing? I asked you whether you'd stop the car, look under the hood, or phone for roadside assistance. Or alternatively, you were going to stick a bandage uh, over the light so that you couldn't see it, uh, and uh, then well, forget about it. Well, think of that warning light on the dash as being like your patient complaining of pain in their big toe joint. They've called you, your roadside assistance now, <laughs> uh, and they've called you to get some help with their problem. So what do you do? Do you address the site of pain, the red light, or do you do that? Well, how would we address the site of pain? Well, we could give some uh, localised anti-inflammatory treatment. Uh, it might be ice therapy, or you might apply some topical neurofin uh, over there, or uh, maybe even uh, recommend they take some anti-inflammatory medication to try and calm down the inflamed site. Maybe you'd fashion a uh, donut pad and put that uh, uh, over the site to take the pressure away from the irritated area. Or maybe you'd put a Morton's extension uh, under uh, the first MP joint in your orthotic device. 
We maybe you even provide some mobilization therapy. Ooh, that would be a bit radical, wouldn't it? Hey, look, these options, they can certainly go a long way to relieving the symptoms that your patient is complaining of. However, if that's all you do, will such interventions actually fully resolve the problem? I mean, just as sticking a, a Band-Aid over the dashboard, the warning light, those treatments, those localised specific treatments, might just be Band-Aid therapy as well. Now, today I'd like to suggest that you go beyond the pain site and have a detailed look under the hood and get more equipped to actually identify the cause of the problem. So, how do we do that? Uh, what, uh, <laughs> how do we look, how do we actually uh, find the potential cause of the problem? What do we look for? And this is where we need to look further into the kinetic chain from one start cut to work our way up the chain. In fact, there might, might it's likely to be other segments of the chain that would be, that could be the cause of the big toe joint problem. Now, skeletally, I'm going to run through five, oh, <laughs> I think she's getting ready to attack me now, I'm not paying enough attention to her. Um, okay, so skeletally, I'm going to run through five joint dysfunction patterns to look out for with your first MP joint cases. So, point number one is, uh, literally, we're going to go from the joint, proximally, now, I did say skeletally, so we're going to look at the skeletal structures. The next structure, approximately, is the first metatarsal me medial cuneiform joint, right here. Now, if there is resistance in this joint, what that does is it limits the amount of dorsi and plantar flexion or mo mobility of the first, uh, the first ray in the first metatarsal. That will have a direct impact on the function of the first MP joint. Number two, what if your client is weight-bearing on a fully pronated subtalar and mid-tarsal joint? Well, we know biomechanically that is then going to overload the first MP joint and create dysfunctional compensation there. Let's go back uh, further into the orthotic chain, uh, sorry, the orthotic chain, the kinetic chain, into the ankle. Uh, now, I do have a little bit of company going on here because someone's just identified uh, the logo uh, on my top. All right, so when we go further back, it's now into the ankle. If we have ankle equinus and there's limited dorsiflexion of the foot, then what's going to happen is the dorsiflexion is going to take place somewhere. And where does that typically happen? Well, it locks the uh, mid-tarsal joints and then we end up getting extra dorsiflexion moments being forced into the first MP joint. What about pes cavus? And we've got the, you know, extra, what about it? Well, we've got the extra steep first metatarsal, with the first metatarsal shaft being more plantarly driven in a pes cavus, particularly a rigid pes cavus foot, that's going to literally force the first MP joint into excessive uh, dorsiflexion moments as well and that can cause an impact in the joint and also the articular surfaces as well. The fifth condition is metatarsus primus elevatus. So this is where literally the first metatarsal is more superior, it's more dorsal, it's more elevated in its position and when that happens it means the articular relationships of the proximal phalanx and the first uh, metatarsal head is compromised and we're unable to get the full range of dorsiflexion. As you'd be aware, to get the full range of dorsiflexion, we need plantar flexion of the first metatarsal so that the proximal phalanx can dorsiflex on top of it. It's why the articular surface has that extended contour more dorsally. So in those scenarios, what's the uh, typical orthotic treatment option? Well, you know, if we've got the pronated foot pattern, we might uh, contour the shell in the archer area to encourage more plantar flexion of uh, the first metatarsal, so we can encourage more dorsiflexion of the hallux. But I remember getting taught at university that, you know, if you did that and it caused more pain, then the other option is the extreme opposite, where you go to a Morton's extension, and with the Morton's extension is to limit the amount of dorsiflexion that takes place in the hallux. So basically you're relying on, you know, what feels better. Not actually getting to the cause, but what are you doing uh, to 
essentially reduce the symptoms rather than treat the cause. So how are we going to identify and treat the cause then? Particularly if it's due to sites of myofascial pathologies, uh, if they're densities uh, or lesions. Uh, myofascial, uh, I suppose, lesions, they have a range of terms from uh, pathologies, densities, lesions, adhesions. They all might have different labels, but they're actually uh, identified in the same way. To identify and treat the cause of first MP joint pathologies, we need to just to review some well understood uh, physiological principles first. The first one is, you'll remember this from uh, university, Davis's law. So this is when literally tissues, if uh, the tissues are placed under stretch, tension or contract, they will adapt. And effectively, affectionately we call it, connective tissues always adapt to their shortest functional length. If they're held in stretch, they'll lengthen. If their tension is taken off, they'll end up shrinking down. Now, this idea that, or physiological concept, connective tissue tightening, what is that? We might have muscles, one of the connective tissues. So we know that muscles uh, with their fibres, uh, they will literally, those uh, fibres will literally interlock more closely as they slide in and the muscles end up tightening up in that way. Uh, collagenous tissues. Um, uh, Wu et al. in the 70s uh, identified the characteristics um, histologically of connective tissues in joints that were immobilised. And what uh, they concluded was the collagen cross linkages increase, and as they increase, then they start locking up and becoming, uh, uh, reducing the mobility of the joint. Now, uh, in that, I know in more recent times, there is uh, research that is um, conflicting with the idea of collagen cross linkages. But the end result, while we may not fully understand 100% accurately the mechanism of what happens, we know the end result is that we get the tissues tightening up and uh, the joint mobility becomes reduced. Myofascia, the lining that wraps around all of the muscles and fibres and cells uh, in, the, the, in the muscular tissue, ends up with densities or adhesions, I think is probably the most accurate term. You see, the, one of the primary functions of myofascia is to wrap around all of the structures and fibrils so that they can slide and glide against each other. But if there's damage, irritation or stress in the area, uh, the fascia becomes dehydrated and instead of sliding, it gets a bit gluggy and glue-like, and then you get adhesions and being stuck in that area. So what's important is in treating first or assessing first MP joint pains is to identify, particularly from a myofascial perspective, if there are any adhesions in the chain distally or more proximally. So how do you do that? Well, uh, you can use your thumbs and fingers, but are you trained? Do you have the skill level that you're confident with that you can identify them with your palpation skills? As a podiatrist, when I was, uh, went through my training, we had very little um, skill development in palpation. I know physios, chiropractors, osteopaths certainly put a lot more emphasis on using their fingers. So what do we do if, we, if our palpation skills are not so um, uh, fine-tuned? Well, we use a tool, and I'm going to... This example here uh, is uh, a tool that's specifically designed for detecting uh, myofascial irregularities. Look, it, you know, it's a stainless steel tool, but if you don't have one of these, you've also got another tool that you can use, and that is your scalpel handle. That's what I used to use uh, before I actually invested in uh, these stainless steel tools. You can use a scalpel handle. I recommend you take the scalpel off uh, the handle and then just literally flick it around and use, you know, if you've got the scalpel blade going on this end, that you literally use the base of the handle and you can run that along specific tissues. You see, the way the tool works, uh, whether it's your scalpel handle or a, a, a purpose-built uh, uh, myofascial release tool, is it, you run it along the actual uh, tissues in question and the, what the tool does is it amplifies any irregularities. It's a bit like uh, back in the day, depending on your age, uh, whether you remember vinyl records and the needle would go into the groove, record would spin around and it would pick up the sound waves. 
So the tool works in a very similar way. It, it kind of helps you hear what's going on in the tissues. What the tool does is when it hits a, a fascial irregularity, it literally bounces. With your finger resting on top, it amplifies what's going on underneath. It, it Literally, you can have no palpation skills and feel, even see, the tool bouncing along fascial irregularities. Now, for first MP joint problems, where do you actually run the tool? Well, you've got to go distal and proximal to the pain site, and distal and proximal along the fascial lines. You see, when we're looking at uh, the actual hallux or first MP joint, distally, we haven't got much, have we? We've literally got the hallux only, and that's it. So what we need to do is check on the insertion points of the extended tendons and also of the flexor tendons. We can go proximally, we've got the whole rest of the body that we can check, but the specific structures that I, I recommend you checking related to first MP joint problems are the extensor digitorum longus muscle and tendons. So you've got the tendons and then the muscle itself. Uh, sorry, that's the extensor hallucis longus, extensor digitorum longus. But you can also go proximally to the interossei muscles, and particularly on the first ray, they're very important sites to check. So if you're going with the long uh, extensor muscles, you can continue further up into the tibialis anterior muscle as well. Often uh, it will show fascial irregularities. The other group of muscles that you need to check as well are the antagonist. So we've got these muscles here. What are the antagonists to those muscles? Well, they are the long flexors, so flexor hallucis longus, flexor digitorum longus. Uh, you've also got the plantar foot muscles, and you can go continue proximally up into the calf, uh, Achilles tendon calf, even up into the hamstrings. Now, the way you actually check these structures, and I'll use my arm here because it's got a little more flesh than the skeleton model there. Not a lot more, but a little more. Um, what you do is the first diagnostic uh, techniques are described as feathering. So literally, it's, it's the weight of the tool and it's about two or 300 grams, so it's not a lot of force. But what you do is you literally have the tool and you run it across oh, the... Oh, oh shit, sorry. All right, okay, so um, it's a bit of a surprise, or not a surprise. Uh, I've got a, I can feel an irritation or a, a bump here and, and right here. So my tendinous junction and also in the belly of the muscle. So what you do is you get the feedback from yourself uh, with the tool, but then you also ask your client. So if you're working along and you feel an area there, you add the pressure a little bit more and ask, like, how does that feel? And two things will happen. One is your client will feel the irregularity, and two, there may be some sensitivity in that area. <laughs> oh, jeez, now I'm pressing there. Oh, yeah, okay. So uh, I've definitely got a trigger point. To, and if you're doing a lot of uh, GTs or manual therapy work, you will commonly have uh, tender points or uh, trigger points or fascial uh, irregularities in uh, those uh, muscles right there. Uh, okay. So once you've identified the connective tissue densities or those tender points, then you need to release them. So it, it's um, a little bit... Uh, Think of that orange bag netting that I mentioned earlier. The idea being is if we've got uh, first MP joint problems here, but uh, we've actually identified uh, the uh, irregularities more proximal or more distal, your first treatment, don't treat the first MP joint site. Only treat the areas proximal and distal that you've identified. That, that's what you do in the first treatment. So someone comes into you, I've got pain here, assess everywhere else and treat those areas. On their follow-up visit, the second visit, collect feedback from your client about the symptomatic site. And here's the kicker. I, I'll tell you what happens. This is going to happen about 50% of the time. Is Probably even more than 50%. Is those clients will come back and they will report that their symptom, original symptomatic site, the first MP joint pain, actually has noticeably improved. 
felt better, it felt freer, it felt less painful. They will describe that, and you didn't even touch it. That is belly button popping right there. When that started happening, thinking, how the heck does that happen? And that is, when you've got densities or restrictions more proximally, it will force the other structures to compensate, which can lead to the symptoms. In my clinical experience, it's about half, maybe even up to 60% of people, you won't even touch the symptomatic side and you'll get noticeable, they'll get noticeable change. And they'll come in and see you and then you can start using anti-inflammatory uh, locally, but you keep on working on uh, those areas that you've identified that were contributing to the problem, more of the cause of the problem uh, rather than just treating the symptomatic site in the first MP joint. Whew. I feel like I've given you a bit of a lesson, a bit of a serve there, but I hope you've gotten some benefit uh, from that. Hey, if you've just joined us, uh, we've had a, a, a terrific show today all about first MP joint conditions and how to treat them. And we looked at the feline kinetic chain that had played a very active role uh, in our show today. Oh shit, our ears have gone flat now and I am in trouble. Um, so in today's show, we've discussed uh, a new perspective on the kinetic chain. Uh, just think, bag of oranges. Uh, we've discussed the myofascial network and clues that it can give us to identify the true cause of your client's first MP joint problems. Uh, we've looked at the anatomical sites for fascial densities, what those muscle groups are proximally, distally, and uh, the antagonists. Uh, we've looked at the tools that we can use to li listen and hear where the problems are. And you don't have to invest into a tool, although I do recommend it. Um, they definitely are worth their weight in gold. Um, we also looked at the five skeletal sites to examine when assessing the first MP joint problems. And we also looked at the treatment and feedback to perform in the first consult, in the first session, that doesn't involve the pain site. <laughs> what a show. Penny Lee, what did you think of that show? Uh, it looks like she's getting ready for bed. Okay. <laughs> so. All of those key pieces and links are available for you. Got them beautifully summarized in our freebie here. Um, this is the freebie. All you have to do is hit the link and you'll be able to download this. So we've got the uh, links on my fascial info. So if you want to find out more about anatomy trains and tool assisted massage, there's a hyperlink there. Uh, if you want to find out about uh, the biomechanical uh, joint uh, dysfunction patterns, the skeletal, the five skeletal sites to check out, they're all listed right here for you. Uh, and the myofascial lines to check. Uh, I've got those listed out, the proximal sites, so the antagonist sites, all down there. So if you haven't taken notes today, uh, they're all there ready for you to claim. Um, if you're watching the show live and you hit the link and uh, it doesn't work, I've just received notice uh, about an hour ago that the hosting platform is closed for um, maintenance work, which of course in the US, it's US based, this time of day is probably not affecting them. Humble apologies for that. Um, however, uh, as soon as uh, it's up and uh, working again, uh, we'll certainly let you know and put a post on uh, the Facebook uh, site. Any questions about what I've covered? Type them in. Um, and uh, if there's, uh, oh, yep, uh, I see. Oh, hang on. Oh. <laughs> uh, okay, great, yes. All right, uh, how can I learn more about treating myofascial problems? Oh, good, great. So um, with that, uh, we, uh, oh, God, a couple of things that's reminded me of. Uh, those of you who are based in um, London coming up uh, next month, uh, Germany and Italy, I just got a notice uh, this morning that your tools uh, have just been shipped. Uh, so those of you who are joining us uh, with the workshops that we're teaching tool assisted uh, massage techniques, um, good news is the logistics are getting ourselves organized. Really looking forward to uh, landing over in uh, the home country uh, in the UK and then venturing across uh, to uh, the Eurozone to run our courses there. So that's uh, great. Um, the, if you want to learn more about uh, the myofascial work, uh, that's where the link uh, to Myobar 
Uh, you can see some of the details there. Uh, skill development, uh, got a couple of things uh, working here in Adelaide, uh, Australia. We have our workshop coming up in uh, November the 17th. Uh, so that's on the website. Uh, and uh, also for those of you who've missed out on our workshops, they've all sold out in uh, Euroland. Uh, we have an online course uh, in the works too. So we'll tell you more about that when the, that comes closer through. All right, now, next week's show, um, I mentioned at the beginning of the show, uh, Dean in the Wild West, Dean Newman, physio, uh, he's uh, been in touch with me, he's got an interesting case uh, uh, that has uh, lots of uh, um, uh, elements there that um, he's needing to manage. Uh, this patient has had uh, surgeries, fusions, uh, releases, uh, and is now experiencing first MP joint pains. So uh, Dean asked me for some advice and suggestions, uh, and I know I've got heaps to share with him, but I also know that uh, I will be able to, uh, you'll benefit from these as well. So I've asked uh, Dean for his permission, if we can actually use his case as an example, and we're going to be using that as a case study in next week's show. So we'll go through uh, assessment, uh, clinical stuff, uh, treatment stuff, all sorts of good things. Uh, it is, um, it's going to be jam-packed, uh, full of useful, relevant stuff for you. Um, Thank you again uh, to Abdulman uh, over in the UK. I really appreciated you being one of the key prime movers to get this, uh, uh, these topics on bunions and first MP joints underway. Uh, Lewis as well from Singapore, uh, who joined us in uh, Perth uh, last uh, two weeks now um, for his request on treating bunions and hamatos without surgery. So you won't want to miss next week's Triple T TV show. It's going to include the real world case study and how we utilize all of the bunion busting tips that we've discussed so far. So thank you very much for joining me today. Uh, let me know what you think of today's show. It's been a huge episode. Penny has uh, just getting herself ready as you'll see here. Uh, Penny, um, no, no. She's uh, way too busy to uh, be bothered uh, with uh, signing off and saying goodbye. Uh, if you haven't already liked uh, this page uh, on uh, Facebook for foot mobilization techniques, please click a like. Uh, if you know of a colleague who uh, would love to benefit from uh, tips on uh, clinical, improving their clinical outcomes for bunions, first MP joint uh, problems, please share it with them. Make sure you join us next week for Triple T TV where we'll explore the real world first MP joint case study so that you can develop a treatment plan for those patients who have already had some surgery. Uh, big heartfelt thanks. Look at this. Boom, 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 boom. Going to Dr. Lil. Um, she's uh, worked uh, tirelessly yesterday and today to make sure that we covered all the points that would help you in your clinical se uh, situation too. So if uh, there's been a hint of benefit and you want to thank Lil on my behalf as well and on your behalf, please send a love heart uh, across the screen. And uh, I know Lil gets uh, great joy uh, from that. It's nice to be appreciated, Ted. Looking forward to showing you my tips again next week. They're going to be upside down. Ready? That's it. No more. <laughs> it's been a blast today. I hope you've had a cracking good time. Remember, you're only one step away from busting bunions. So claim your free download now. Hit the link and I'll look forward to catching up with you next week. Cheers.